We are very pleased to have uh, John Bonin as our keynote spe uh, speaker for this um, fifth uh, annual workshop. John comes from the Wesleyan University. Also, I learned today that he comes from Dan and Louis Analysis Group, <laughs> Boston. Uh, uh, John uh, wrote a lot, uh, among other things, on uh, transition economics banking. And he was an editor of Journal of Comparative Economics and uh, is quite uh, famous for many contributions to the growing of field of comparative economics. And we're very happy to have him here to talk about the uh, impact of foreign banks on cut and run. I, I don't know what that means exactly. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Vladimir. Um, I, I first want to start off by uh, expressing my tremendous appreciation to, uh, to Masha and Vladimir for inviting me uh, to this workshop. I know that you've invited me in the past and I couldn't come and I'm so happy to be here this time. But I'd also just like to say that uh, Masha and her staff have, have given me so much help uh, along the way. And it's, uh, at my age, it's kind of tough to travel sometimes and this was a pleasure. So I really appreciate everything you've done for me. It, it's been a, been a great help. Um, I'm here to talk about something that's actually uh, uh, work with a collaborator, uh, Dana Louis. Dana Louis was a former student of mine. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's okay. I, I, I was once introduced in England uh, where they used my, my professorship and they called me John Bone and Andrews. And I guess in England they were used to sort of hyphenated names and I was the Andrews Professor of Economics. I, so I have no Andrews in my name. So this is, this is sort of common. And my apology, I didn't make it so clear on the slide either. Um, Dana is a former student of mine. She's now working with analysis group in Boston. I'm hoping this is transitory and I can get her to convince her to go to, into a PhD program because she's one of the brightest students I've had in almost 40, in over 45 years of teaching. Um, we started working together on this a couple summers ago when she was an intern at our, our quantitative uh, analysis center for the summer. And it was like working with a colleague almost. I mean, she, she would come in the office every morning and I'd say, you did all that already? You mean I have to get back to work? So I, I worked harder that summer than I think I'd worked since graduate school on anything. Uh, so, so there's a lot in this paper from Dana. Now, um, I'll explain cut and run later. Uh, the motivation for the paper is to examine the lending behavior of foreign banks during the global financial crisis and at the onset of the Eurozone crisis when the Greek default sort of seemed to be eminent. Um, what we do in this paper, which we, we claim uh, are, is different from the literature and, and hence an innovation, is that we first recognize the impact of what was a ubiquitous in the area currency de depreciation in 2009. Now, you know, if you step back from banking and think about that, it makes sense. I mean, the real economy was starting to feel the effects of the global financial crisis, so for countries that could use this instrument, uh, had flexible foreign exchange rates, depreciation was a reasonable uh, thing to do. We focus on the real loan growth rate that is adjusted for inflation in domestic currency as a dependent variable. It's very important for you to keep that in mind as we go through the presentation because some of the things that happen in the data are going to be reflected in the fact that there was considerable depreciation in 2009. So I just want to warn you about that. But most importantly, and for um, any of you who have seen any of the stuff I've done before, we separate the foreign banks into two categories. Uh, what I'm now referring to as the big six, which are namely Raiffeisen, Erste, Intesa Sao Paulo, Societe General, uh, KBC, and Unicredit. And we separate these out from the other foreign banks. Virtually all the other literature of which I'm aware does not do this. They just have a foreign bank dummy. And we consider this a very important thing to do because these banks have a very different business model in the region than other foreign banks. And we consider the two crisis periods which I mentioned before. The time period coincides with three distinct sub-time periods. Uh, one, a credit boom, which is primarily a retail credit boom, where um, what is, even at that time, somewhat of a nascent market 
uh, if you compare, when EBRD compares these countries to other countries that have similar characteristics, one of the things that always shows up is things like mortgages to GDP and uh, other types of retail credit to GDP are always much lower than you would expect given the other characteristics of the, the economies. So this was a, a, a nascent market and it was a very profitable market and the foreign banks uh, went into this with, uh, with a vengeance. Then the global financial crisis comes along and then I'm claiming that 2010 we can look at as the onset of the Eurozone crisis. Uh, we have eight countries. These are all countries that uh, with the exception of Croatia by the end of 2010 had joined the EU. So I consider them kind of the new member states. Uh, BG, I'll tell you what the abbreviations are, Bulgaria, or they should be self-evident, Czech Republic, uh, HR is Croatia, um, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, or Slovak Republic, and Slovenia. Now you might notice that I don't have any Baltic countries in here. And the reason I don't have Baltic countries in here is because basically the main bank in the Baltic region is Fedbank. And so that's a seventh bank, but it means that you can kind of take, and some of the work on contagion by people who use BIS data and all show that this, this sort of region of the Baltics is separable on many dimensions from the rest of the region. So I leave this out and focus only on what the IMF is now calling CESE, -E, which I think stands for Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe, uh, which is a mouthful. So I will kind of vacillate between using CESE -E and Emerging Europe as what we're talking about. Now this group of countries has considerable comparability, but also some diversity. Uh, three of them at the end of the data period are basically uh, in the Eurozone. Slovenia is in the Eurozone throughout the entire period. Uh, Slovakia joins in 2009. So in the beginning part of the period, they're in the accession to the Eurozone. And that means that they have a lot of comparability with Eurozone countries. And Bulgaria has a currency board. Bulgaria's had a currency board since 1997. Um, and the fixed peg to the Euro throughout this entire period is held. So for all intents and purposes, uh, Bulgaria is Euroized. I think that's a correct term. Um, they have similar credit growth cycles, as I'll show you. Um, majority foreign ownership of banking assets, for the most part, except for Slovenia. Slovenia is an outlier on this. And they have a similar exchange rate dynamics for the five plus countries that have non fixed uh, exchange rates during this period. I'm going to go through the literature quickly because the literature that I, it's a selected literature, selected by me for the following reasons. I want to identify the key bank explanatory variables and they are size, capitalization, the um, a ve a variable that's supposed to pick up the funding uh, for the bank. So it's loans to deposits. Uh, and when that's high, we, we think of the bank as having a, a lot of wholesale funding. Um, and returns on average assets for profitability. I want to motivate the inclusion of the exchange rate dynamics. In particular, some of the literature that I have here focuses on the forex lending in these countries during this time period. And I also want to motivate the separation of the big six from the other foreign banks. So I'll go quickly through this since I know the slides are going to be up for you to look at. Uh, certainly you can get that information. At the end of the slides, I have all the actual citations, so you can actually look at the literature if you don't know it. Uh, so, but if you have any interest in any of these things, I can come back to them in the question period. Uh, the first one, RV and her co-authors, uses uh, BIS data on cross-border positions. Um, one of the things it does is make it clear that the separation of the Baltics is a useful thing to do. Um, and secondly, it, it notes this important fact that for the big six, their share in income in the region is greater than their share in assets. So this is going to motivate what I, what, what I will borrow a term from another author and call the second home market. That for these banks, this region is really uh, almost like a home market. Uh, Mackler and Ong uh, 
established the importance of forex lending to households in these countries and to make the point that contagion risk depends on the reliance on interbank liquidity. So this is a uh, motivation for including the wholesale funding variable in the, uh, in the regressions. Uh, Rolf de Haas, which I probably mispronounced good, and his co-author uh, look at internal capital markets. Now, uh, in this paper, you can see that they're using these, these papers that I'm talking about right now use data prior to the crisis. But they make a distinction between greenfield subsidiaries, which are basically the subsidiaries of a Western bank that come in and establish a greenfield operation, from those that come in and take over an extant bank in the country, basically during the previous about decade to decade and a half where the privatization process went on and state banks were converted to private banks, ultimately sometimes took a while, but ultimately to majority foreign ownership. And these takeover banks, I'm going to call FTBs, just again for simplicity. And, and the difference in this paper establishes the fact that the greenfields tend to act more like, their business model is more like a portfolio business model, where they look across the countries in which they're participating, and they adjust their positions in the countries based on the economic characteristics of the countries. Whereas what they find for the takeover banks is they tend to be, not do that, they tend to be more committed to the uh, host country. Again, using the host country as a, as a home market. And um, they certainly find that during this earlier period, the foreign takeover banks maintain their lending during host country crises. Uh, Brown and, and De Haas, De Haas is gonna be throughout this literature search because he's done a lot of work here. Uh, use a survey of banks. BEPS is a survey of 193 banks in the region. And from that survey, they call out, it's an EBRD survey, Rolf is at the EBRD, that the foreign takeover banks did fuel the retail credit boom. So they were active in this retail credit boom. And that foreign banks in general provided FX lending during this time period in these countries, but mainly to corporate clients, not to households. Now there are some important distinctions uh, and we'll get to those in a minute. The next set of literature is a segue to the crisis period or the crises period. And uh, Popoff and Udell use different EBRD surveys. These are, BEEPs are surveys of firms. And they have two waves, 2005 and 2008. And this looks at the demand side of the market. So this is why I introduced this, this paper for the time being. Uh, they find that small medium enterprise lending is more credit constrained in regions where the foreign bank subsidiaries are undercapitalized. So the importance of including a capitalization variable uh, in the regressions. Uh, Beck and his colleagues combine the two EBRD surveys and look at relational lending and they find that relational lending actually alleviates credit constraints during cyclical downturns but they don't find any effect during a boom period. So one of the things that's, that's important to do, again, from our perspective, is to see whether this is consistent when we separate out the big six banks. Uh, Anjana and Schindel look at Hungary only um, in this time period that is basically includes the global financial crisis. And they find that less capitalized banks increase risk by increasing Forex lending in Hungary. So Hungary is a good example of a country in which household credit gets established in, in uh, foreign exchange. I'm, I'm sorry, Forex, you, you understand what I'm saying when I say Forex, foreign exchange. And the, um, we have all kinds of well-known famous stories about mortgages in Swiss francs and in Hungary and the effect that had and what the current administration did in its infinite wisdom to handle that problem. Um, so that's a side story that we can talk about at lunch or over coffee. Uh, but in any case, what it points out to us is the importance of keeping country-specific information in mind when we do the, the empirical work. Uh, Steen Clayson and, and his co-author, Nelter van, van Horen, uh, have a huge data set of 137 countries. They look at a period from earlier time, from our period into our period. And 
what they find is during the global financial crisis all over the world, foreign banks decreased their lending more on average than domestic banks. DB stands for domestic banks. But not when a foreign bank had market dominance. So our importance from this sort of global study that they do, what we take from that is the importance, again, of looking at the difference between the big six banks and other foreign banks. Uh, they also show that balance sheet differences matter. Uh, De Haas and Van Lillefeld uh, look at 48 multinational banks all over the world, and they also find that these multinational subsidiaries tend to decrease credit growth uh, considerably faster than domestic banks during the global financial crisis. And although, therefore, they conclude foreign banks mitigate domestic shocks, they transmit uh, external shocks. Uh, they also have some results about weak parents that are useful to consider only in, in certain countries. So here's what I mean by cut and run. By cut and run, I mean that foreign banks are in in the good times and they cut and run in the bad times, which means that they withdraw. And it's a relative withdrawal. They don't close down shop, but they withdraw and make less and are less active in lending than domestic banks. So that's what cut and run means to us. During the crisis period, um, the literature, selective literature that I look at is first one by Vucic on uh, internal capital markets. And there are only a few years in this, but what I use this for is to uh, show that foreign banks with higher sovereign risk exposure to distressed countries curtailed their intergroup funding uh, to subsidiaries during the global financial crisis. So this is again evidence of some transmission effect. This is of the global financial crisis. Now, getting into the literature that's closer to what, what we do. Uh, De Haas and a, several of his co-authors at the EBRD look at, when I say EU11, that includes the eight countries that we're looking at plus the Baltics. So that's the EU11. And they have five other countries. They look at a time period that predates our time period and actually has an extra year put on. Uh, and what they're interested in doing, uh, perhaps because they're at the EBRD, is kind of demonstrating that the Vienna Initiative, which was something that the EBRD was involved in organizing, uh, was effective. And what they find is that foreign subsidiaries curtailed their credit more aggressively than domestic banks in the global financial crisis period 2008 to 2009 in general. But the banks that were part of the Vienna, so they cut and ran. Banks that were part of the Vienna Initiative were relatively stable lenders in the countries that were part of the Vienna Initiative, but also in the non-Vienna Initiative countries. So this was an important result for them because it established that there wasn't a spillover effect. You didn't have negative externalities from countries that belonged to the Vienna Initiative, and they were basically, the banks were, were propping those countries up, but then cutting and running in their in the countries that were not part of the Vienna Initiative. Um, Rachel Epstein, who is a political economist, she's actually a political scientist, uh, whose work I really like. She does a lot of careful survey work. She takes a very contrarian view on the Vienna Initiative. And she claims that what went on during this time was really based on the business model of the foreign takeover banks in the region. And she was the one I borrowed this term second home market from. She shows that the deep financial integration of the big six led to a commitment to clients in the region and only a modest retention in their second home market during the crisis. Now her work doesn't do any what we would consider as economists serious empirical work. There's very, very careful survey work and, and it's, it's extremely useful for kind of contextualizing uh, what we did ourselves. The paper that's closest to what we do is a paper by Bob Cull and Soleil Martinez Pereira at the World Bank, uh, and we're indebted to them for, they shared their data with us, so this, this, we have lots of debt to them. Their paper was actually broader than ours because they looked at differences with Latin American countries uh, and how the banks in Latin American countries and the region responded to the global financial crisis. They found that foreign banks, and I'm going to only look at their results for the region, they found that foreign banks fueled the retail credit boom using wholesale funding from non-local sources 
They reduced lending more than domestic banks during the crisis period. Now their, their data only go up to 2009. So the additional year was an additional year of data that I think helped us put in perspective some of the differences between our paper and their paper. And that larger banks, um, they did not make this distinction between the big six and other foreign banks. They just used a dummy for all foreign banks. But that larger banks stabilized lending in 2009. Now there's obviously a correlation between larger banks and the big six in the region. So that's, I think, something that's important to keep in mind. Okay, so for us, the missing links were firstly exchange rate dynamics. Um, in the non-fixed countries, so that's the five countries that uh, are not part of the Eurozone and Slovakia up until 2008 when it joined the Eurozone in 2009, you had persistent appreciation vis-a-vis -vis the Euro until 2008 with the exceptions noted. Uniform depreciation in 2009. I've given you a range of the depreciation. So this is domestic currency to the Euro in uh, HR again is Croatia. In Croatia it was minimal, a little under, a little around 1.5 percent. In Poland it was huge, 23.2 percent. And then in 2010 you have uniform appreciation. Now you can see the appreciation doesn't have the same extremes that the depreciation has. In fact if you focus on the RO is Romania, so you can see Romania appreciated almost minimally. But Poland appreciates, but no, nowhere near as much as it had depreciated in 2009. So you have this kind of strange effect between 2009 and 2010 of uniform depreciation followed by uniform appreciation. I think it's important to keep that in mind when we look at the data at the bank level. Uh, the Vienna Initiative. Okay, uh, one of the reasons why Rachel Epstein thinks that the Vienna Initiative uh, was not what the EBRD economists thought it to be, is that in actuality, the initiative for the initiative, so to speak, came from the big six themselves. In November of 2008, the big six banks wrote a letter to the uh, European Commission urging some kind of coordinated intervention. The participants became five countries and 17 banking groups along with the uh, IFIs and the IMF. Um, the only countries in our data set that are country participants are Hungary and Romania. And they signed their commitment letter in May of 2009. Now, here was the issue. Was this a coordination problem? This is what the EBRD economists are focusing on. Um, and the idea was, you know, for an individual bank it might make sense to cut and run, to really de de depress its activity in the region and actually take some of the banking assets back home. And in some countries the bailout uh, programs required banks to do this. No, kind of shaking his head. So it's, are you shaking your head saying it's wrong or are you shaking your head because it's Belgium? <laughs> uh, okay, he will tell me later whether what I said is correct. But in any case, that's not really relevant for what I want to do. The issue is, you know, is this truly a coordination problem? And was this then the Vienna Initiative a real signal that as a group, the banks wouldn't leave the region en masse and cut and run? Or, as Rachel Epstein claims, was it a very strategic activity on the bank's part to extract some forbearance from host regulators. And uh, I must say I'm more persuaded that that's what was going on than the former, that it was truly a coordination problem. Okay. Uh, just a small clarification yep. question. Uh, so these big four, uh, sorry, big six, uh, is it, uh, so why is it not big eight or big ten? Is it because they have a big share of their assets in, in the region, or it's because they're multinational? So, why, so how, what is the criteria and how did you see okay. about those things? These are the Western multinational banks that have the largest market shares within the host countries. Okay, so yes, and, and um, if you, actually, okay, maybe I should step back for a minute because this may not be something that you all know. 
Um, the way this developed was kind of interesting. Uh, Rafaisen, for example, started out with greenfield operations virtually throughout the region, setting up subsidiaries, and um, grew over time, grew its market share over time. The other banks tended to either just take over what were former state-owned banks. So Aster, for example, is a, had a very different strategy. It took over the large savings banks, the sort of spare banks of the region, and um, as majority, I mean, almost unitary ownership. Um, and so they, they took over the savings banks and used domestic deposits for funding. Um, Okay, and Tessa is a kind of new kid on the block. And Tessa Sao Paulo comes in later on in the data period toward the early, late 1990s, early 2000s. And um, again, takes over extant banks in the region. Um, Societe Generale has had an exposure in the region for a long time. It's, so it has, and it, it has gone in by taking over existing banks as part of the privatization process. Uh, KBC has, is the, the, the one of the big six that has a, sort of the least exposure right now in the region. Uh, it had for a long time the only meaningful exposure in Slovenia, but it's now out of Slovenia as well, isn't it? Yes. Totally. Yeah, but it was, a, it was 30%. It was, it was big minority. <laughs> I mean, because at the time when, when these other banks were in, in the privatization process, they didn't take majority ownership immediately. They tended to, to take a minority stake and then build it up over time to a majority stake. Uh, oh, and I'm missing the big elephant, uh, Unicredito. Okay, Unicredit is this huge conglomerate of banks that uh, started off in the region from Austrian banks like Credit Anstalt and Bank Austria. And these banks had both greenfield operations initially in the region, and then they started to take over extant regional banks in the privatization, project, uh, in the privatization program, and then they merged. So there were mergers of the regional banks, and then at the same time, these banks were merged at the mother level in Europe onto this big umbrella unit credit. Now, virtually all of the banking activity in unit credit in the region is run out of the Austrian division of Unicredit. So whether you consider it an Italian bank or an Austrian bank is kind of problematic because it is, its, its headquarters are in Italy, but all of the banking activity is run out of Austria, basically the Austrian division. Does that help to give you some context for this? And the other, I mean, the other big bank in the region is Fedbank, but it's, it's only in the Baltics, it's not in the, in the other countries. So that's, that's why we take that out. Okay. Are there any other? I'm happy. Please stop me for clarification questions because I don't know how much you know detailed information you'd like to follow. Okay. okay. Um, here's what we do. The data come from Bankscope, and at the beginning we have 256, and I want to put banks right now in in quotes, banks that gave us 1791 observations. When we eliminate missing variables, we get down to 1061 observations. Then we do two things. Firstly, we trim. Um, by the way, I hate Windsorizing. So this is why I trim rather than Windsorize. Okay, I don't like fat tails. So um, now, I, I know that there's disagreement on which is the better thing to do, but I think if you know a lot about the stuff, which you people obviously do, it's better to trim than Windsorize. But that's just my own opinion. And a referee may have a different opinion. Um, so the, the reason, what we do is we trim the dependent variable, take off the top 2.4% of the observations, bottom uh, half of a percent of the observations. And so we lose 26 observations that way. The dependent variable, uh, I'm sorry if I went over that too quickly, the dependent variable is loan growth in the domestic currency. So when you have a really, really high rate Usually what happens, it's because a bank has taken, uh, either exited the market or entered the market in a year. And so because these are annual data, it, it, it messes up those, those calculations. Um, we also do some trimming of the explanatory variables. 
Um, not size, but the other three explanatory variables. So loan to deposit ratio, return, of a, uh, uh, return on average assets, and the equity to asset ratio. And that brings us down another 65 observations after we've trimmed the dependent variable. Then we do what I call cleaning. And cleaning is removing institutions that I'm not interested in, but the bank scope considers banks. So basically what I hear are there are very few public banks in the region at this time. And I want to be clear on this for anyone who knows the banking sector of the region. I am not taking out uh, the Polish, the large Polish bank, PKLBP. I'm considering that a domestic bank, not a private foreign bank, because it's basically controlled domestically by non -government, a non-government corporate board. Um, but what I do take out are public banks like Axiom Banks, I mean, because they have a niche market. I take out the developing banks. Bankscope copes, uh, codes developing banks as banks. Um, I take out building societies. This is probably more important in countries like Poland. Uh, and if I were looking at mortgages, I wouldn't do that. But since I'm not looking at mortgages, I, I take out car finance companies. So if you look through the bank scope data uh, in the region, I don't know what they do in Russia, but if you look through it in the region, uh, you'll see things like uh, Volkswagen as a bank. Uh, so I, you know, Volkswagen's not a bank. It's lots of other things. Okay. Now, um, my apologies. <laughs> So that gives us a final number of observations of 868 and 194 of what we think are real banks and banks that we're interested in. Uh, quickly, here are the variable definitions and the descriptive statistics. So uh, if you just look at the means of the variables, you'll see that on average, real loan growth is about 16% per annum during this time period in the region. Uh, GDP growth is a little under 3%. Assets, that's log of assets. Um, when we do the explanatory variables, we introduce them in a lagged way. That's why it says lag, but you know, obviously the mean isn't affected by lagging. Um, equity ratio. Loans to deposits. Now, I, I want to focus on that for a minute. That's why it's red. I think it's red, yes. Um, loans to deposits is greater than one. So that means there is, on average, a considerable amount of wholesale funding going on in the region. Um, return on assets, banks are relatively profitable, 1%. That looks very low. If you look at inflation, it means in real terms they're yeah. losing. <laughs> um, I guess, but it's, uh, yes. Okay, I guess that's correct. So it's not inflation adjusted, I don't think. Okay. Yeah, I have time fixed effects. No, I don't have time fixed effects. I have country fixed effects. No, I can't put in time fixed effects with the crisis dummies. Yes. Well, okay. I mean, I don't because I worry about double counting. Okay. Without empirical work, just uh, these numbers, seems like banks are not that profitable. Well, yeah, return on equity is, is much higher, of oh, course. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is these are assets. I mean, you know, the return on assets in most countries is on is a half a percent of, if half a percent is good. So, you know, compared to their home countries, this is good, but I, you know, you're right, I hadn't thought fully through the inflation issue. You have to multiply it by 10, right? So the equity to assets ratio is 10%. Yeah. So the return so on equity is 10%. 10%. Yeah. 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 It's still yeah. But it's, it's above inflation. Yeah, it's above inflation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I'll, I'll make note of that so that a referee doesn't zing me on it. Um, and you can see that depreciation throughout the, uh, for the whole time period, on average, uh, there is uh, overall appreciation. So uh, this is important. I mean, a uh, minus sign for the explanatory variable uh, connotes appreciation. Uh, okay, actually I have a slide that kind of probably says some of the things I'm saying. Uh, you can see that 24% of the observations are big six bank observations. 
and 36% of domestic banks, leaving 40% in this other foreign category. So in terms of the observations, the dominant categories are other foreign and domestic, but in terms of the market shares, it's the opposite. Uh, okay, I said all these things. Okay, I think the rest of the slide is, on average, exchange rates appreciate, inflation slightly over 4%, real GDP growth almost 3%. So now, if you look at the ownership of banking assets by country, you can see that there's significant diversity. So in countries like the Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Croatia, the big six dominate to a considerable extent. I mean, Czechos the Czech Republic being the one in which it's, it's almost complete dominance. Uh, in the Czech Republic, there are virtually no domestic banks, domestic control banks. Uh, you can see that in Romania, the big six also have a, a greater than 50% market share. Uh, but that changes dramatically over that five year, over that half decade period uh, for the big six. Um, and there's Slovenia off on the other side. I get by 2010, KBC still in, so we're still counting KBC in Slovenia in 2010. So that's why the Slovenia, because KBC, I'm sorry, KBC is a had a minority share in the largest, and it's it's a market share of the largest Slovenian bank is huge. So this is this is why that's showing up in Slovenia. But you can see that the, the domestic banks have a a very uh, dominant market share market share in Slovenia. Um, now I'm going to have to do a little bit of, I'm going to go there first and come back. Um, this is real loan growth by country. I hope the colors come out because if they don't, you can't distinguish the countries. But, um, and these are in domestic currency. So what you can see here in this slide with, uh, with real growth uh, per country is that bank lending was quite robust in the period before the global financial crisis in the region with some country spikes that are quite dramatic uh, early before 2007. Then this decelerates considerably in all countries. It becomes negative, sharply negative in the Czech Republic. It spikes upward again in 2009. Now, here's where I cautioned you before. Remember, I'm using domestic currency. So some of that spike up has to do with a revaluation of the uh, stock of loans because of the depreciation. Okay. And then it goes back in 2010 to a very modest level, in some cases even negative. So that's what real loan growth based on domestic currency looks like for those eight countries. Now I don't have it in my slide presentation, but we did the same thing in dollars. And the picture, the numbers are different but the picture is virtually the same. I mean, there's no distinguishing difference between the picture if you do it in dollars and the picture if you do it in, in uh, domestic currency. I didn't do it in euros, so the euro dollar cross rate would matter, but I was pretty convinced that this was, this was a reasonable story on what was going on. So, as I said, uh, this is what you saw with respect to bank lending growth, robust bank lending prior to 2008. Uh, country spikes. Now with bank ownership, there are changes over the period. The big six increased their market share in Bulgaria and Slovakia, also to a lesser extent in Hungary and Poland, but they decreased market share considerably in Romania and to a lesser extent in Slovenia. Now I put Romania in yellow so you could see what was happening to the market share of the other categories in Romania. So who did the big six lose market share to in Romania? Firstly, they lost some of it, about a third of it, a quarter of it, to other foreign banks. Uh, you'll see that other foreign banks made a big jump in market share in Slovenia in this time. They were virtually non-existent at the beginning of the data period. They became more important as KBC was pulling out, it was clear that KBC was pulling out. Um, there was a significant decrease in other foreign banks' market share in Slovakia, decrease not as significant in Hungary and Poland, and then domestic banks were the ones that increased their market share 
uh, considerably taking over for the big six drop in Romania. Uh, and again, Slovakia, there was an increase as well. And you can see decreases in Bulgaria and Slovenia. So what does this all mean? It means that we see at least seeds of a story where there's some movement from the northern tier countries to the southern tier countries by other foreign banks. Okay, not the big six, but other foreign banks. Now the reason that was important to me was when I first started doing this, I was convinced that I should have a dummy in there for Greek banks. Okay. Uh, and we actually put a dummy in for Greek banks for a while to see whether that mattered. And it turns out, it, this isn't a story about Greek banks. I was surprised. It's a story about that whole class of other foreign banks. Um, you've seen that already. Uh, here's a correlation matrix. Uh, if you just look at the first column, this would be, you know, the simple correlates of loan growth to everything else. You'll see, you don't see anything going on in the ownership categories. The omitted category is domestic banks. You uh, do get a positive correlation between GDP growth and loan growth, but it's not significant as a simple correlation. You'll see that when we do the, uh, the regressions in the multiple regressions, we get strong procyclicality between GDP growth and loan growth, which was, I thought, a really good sign because this means these banking sectors look normal, uh, like what we would expect in a developed uh, banking sector. Uh, assets, equity, you see that, that the equity ratio significantly has a significant impact on loan growth so that well-capitalized banks uh, have much higher loan growth. Now, just on a simple correlation coefficient, you might think, well, that means these are these big six guys who are in there. Turns out that's wrong, and you'll see when we go to the regressions. Um, okay, inflation has a positive but not statistically significant effect by the simple correlation on loan growth, but depreciation by the simple correlation coefficient has a very strong positive impact on loan growth. Hence. Uh, I think justifying our inclusion of depreciation. Uh, from this correlation matrix, whoops, okay. come back to it for a minute. Uh, the other things that you can see are that the big six in general are big, so hence big. The asset correlation between big six, six and assets is strongly positive, but they're not highly capitalized. In fact, they're less capitalized than average in the region, uh, and they have higher returns than other banks in the region. Whereas if you look at the other foreign banks, it's exactly the opposite. They're not bigger, they are more capitalized, they're less profitable, and they use uh, more wholesale financing. So what we're not seeing in, the, in these data, at least, is that strong impact of the big six banks sourcing elsewhere out of the region. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, the other thing, maybe down in the far corner, which probably none of you can see, is a simple correlation between inflation and depreciation. And you show it, pass-through comes up as a positive correlation, which is what you would expect. Uh, whoops. OK, so what do we do? Dependent variable is real loan growth in domestic currency. It's a pooled OLS with country fixed effects. We include country fixed effects because we're concerned about things like uh, from the Hungary paper, what might be going on in a specific country with respect to lending, but also because even though these are countries that are either in the EU or about to be in the EU during this time period, so you'd expect a lot of institutional homogeneity, at least uh, de jure, de facto in terms of implementation, you could have significant differences. So we think it's important to include country fixed effects. Uh, clustered robust standard errors. Uh, those are priors for some of the variables, which we can discuss if you wish why I had those priors, but it's not terribly important. I'd like to get to the results. So what we do then is build up, and I, I'm sorry, this is gonna be a little bit difficult because I have this on two slides. I couldn't, these regressions are too big. I couldn't put all the bank characteristics in 
this table. So I've got another table with the bank characteristics. So I'm going to be flipping back and forth between two tables. Uh, I hope you don't get dizzy when I do it, but that's the only way I could handle this. So let's look at model one. Model one is the simple model. Um, you can see that ownership doesn't seem to have any impact on bank lending in a simple model. Uh, you see procyclicality, positive relationship between GDP growth and bank lending. You see a negative relationship between inflation and bank lending and a positive relationship between depreciation and bank lending. We go to the bank characteristics. You'll see that larger banks actually, on average, lend less. Uh, and that the more profitable banks, there's a correlation between being more profitable and lending more. I don't want to say causation, just correlation. Okay. So then what do we do? In model two, we say, gee, we're interested in the crisis, so let's dummy out the crisis years. So when we dummy out the crisis years, here's what it looks like. What you find in dumbing out the crisis years is that 2008 was a bad year for bank lending. 2009 turned out to be a good year for bank lending. And 2010 is moderately significantly bad. Now those are just strict dummies. So what we want to do in model three is consider now the interaction between bank ownership and the crisis years to see if we can tease out whether or not the big six and the other foreign banks behave differently in the crisis. So that's the point of model three. Now, right, is there a, well, I'll point it out. Right down here, you see there's no bank characteristic interactions here. So the difference between model three and model four, you can't see on this slide. You have to wait till the next slide to see the difference. But I want to assure you they are different so that you don't get confused about why the numbers are different. Okay. So in model three, we put the interactive term between uh, the ownership variables, ownership category variables, and crisis. And voila, what do we find? We find that these other foreign banks are cutting and running during the crisis, and significantly cutting and running during the crisis. But the big six aren't. I mean, there's a little bit of an effect in 2010 down there. It's going to go away once we put the bank characteristic interaction terms in. So I don't want to make a big deal about that in Model 3. But what Model 3 does is really look at this interactive relationship between ownership and uh, maybe I'll go here so you can see the difference between uh, Model 3 and Model 4. So in Model 4, I've now interacted bank characteristics with the crisis years. And so what Model 4 tells you is that basically banks that are better capitalized um, reduce lending less in the crisis year 2008 and 2009. Uh, and banks that use more wholesale funding, that is have lower loan to deposit ratios, actually reduce lending more. Uh, back here again. So what Model 5 does is now introduce interaction terms between uh, the depreciation variable and the crisis year dummies. So if you focus actually on 2009, well, let's take 2008 first. If you focus on 2008 and you look at the interactive term and its coefficient, and you look at the coefficient of depreciation by itself, what you'll see is when you add those two things together, you get virtually no effect. So the appreciation in 2008 is not showing any effect at all in, in the crisis year. When you get to 2009, you see the interactive term now is strongly, continues to be strongly negative. Uh, but now remember that, that in 2009 we have appreciation. So when you combine the change in sign in the depreciation variable with that, what you see is that the depreciation had a significant impact. Uh, in 2009. In terms of bank characteristics, um, the capitalization result is robust. Better capital ba capitalized banks provide uh, more than average lending in 2008 and 2010. The wholesale funding result is robust. I, I grant it's only statistically significant at the 10% level. And we find in 2010 another uh, effect of the loan to deposit ratio. So what are the results? <laughs>
the non-big six banks, oh, actually I didn't point that out when we were looking at the results. Let me go back. If you look at the first row, other foreign, once we get to model three, becomes significant and positive. So what we find when we start using the interactive terms and separating out the crisis and the cross relationship between ownership and crisis is that foreign banks really were a big part of the story of the retail credit boom, the periods that are not part of the crisis. So that's, those are those green terms up there from model three on. So we claim that we find non-big six, the other foreign banks, tend to lend more than domestic banks uh, in the good times, but then cut and run during the crisis, uh, decrease their lending significantly. The big six maintain their commitment to the second home market in the sense that we find no statistically discernible difference between, when we correlate, between the big 10 and domestic banks in the crisis years. Uh, as I've said several times, bank lending is strongly pro-cyclical. Uh, growth in bank lending increases as domestic currency decreases. Now when we look at the crisis, we were really kind of interested in seeing whether we could tease anything out of this with respect to how the crisis period was different. And I think this is important for all of us when we're doing papers in this time period to see what the difference is in the crisis period. Hence, in my discussions comments, I was talking about the importance of doing that in, in Marsha and Kern's paper as well. Bank lending is considerably bo below average in 2008, but considerably above average in 2009. We saw that from the simple dummies. 2010 was a little bit ambiguous and not consistent. Bank capitalization, however, and this was consistent, tends to buoy up lending during the crisis periods. Bank size may have a positive impact on lending in 2008, but it has a negative impact in 2010. That's a kind of strange result. Why would big banks behave differently in 2008 than in 2010? Uh, this may give us a little inkling that these are two different crises. And in the paper, I, I told Marsha that I, I sent a draft, it's a very, very preliminary draft of, of the paper, and I'm perfectly happy to have it up on the website. So if you want to read the paper, uh, it will be there. And, and we, we say that, you know, this is very, very preliminary, that maybe we're beginning to pick up a difference in how banks responded to the two different crises, and this might be something that we should think about doing further work on. But uh, obviously you need to bring the data f forward to do that. And that wholesale funding may have a negative impact on lending in 2010. When I use terms like may, that just means I don't have a lot of statistical significance in the correlates. Uh, we did some robustness. We first divided the sample into the countries that had flexible exchange rate regimes and the countries that had were Euro, Euroized, either part of the Eurozone or on a fixed peg with the Euro. And you'll see that when we do this in the non-fixed countries, uh, the results of interest uh, go through. So pro-cyclicality, uh, depreciation tends to have a positive effect on loan growth. The crisis years in 2008 are maintained. 2010, we don't see as much of an effect. Uh, more importantly, we do see the cut and run by the other foreign banks. So you, you see clearly those, those uh, interactive terms between foreign, which means other foreign, and the crisis years continue to be negative and statistically significant. And once we get out of model three, we don't see any impact uh, any sub significantly, statistically significant difference between the big six and domestic banks. Depreciation has the same impact that we saw as you would expect since these are the countries that depreciate. So it's, it's nice when we saw this that we got consistent results when we broke the sample. Uh, I'm not going to show you the interaction with the bank characteristics, but it's the same. In model three there is none, and in model four and five we have bank characteristics interacted. The fixed countries show a different picture. In the fixed countries, lots of stuff is not significant. In fact, the only consistently significant coefficient for the fixed countries is inflation. So in the fixed exchange rate countries, what we're seeing is that the inflation variable is picking up most of the statistical significance of what might be attributed to a pro-cyclical GDP variable. And the 
pro-cyclical GDP variable pretty much goes away. It's there to a minor extent. Um, most noticeably, once you get to Model 5, when you include all the bank characteristics, there's virtually not much going on in these countries on Model 4, sorry. There's no distinction between Model 4 and Model 5 for these countries because they don't have depreciation. So what we conclude by breaking the sample this, oh, okay. What we, what we conclude by breaking the sample this way is that in the Euroized countries, Bank lending is positively related to inflation, but we lose the GDP cyclical result. Now, clearly, inflation and GDP growth uh, may have a, have a positive correlation, too. So this is maybe an indirect effect, but we don't pick up a direct effect on the real GDP growth. There's no evidence of the impact of bank ownership on lending, even during the crisis. There's no cut and run by any foreign banks. Again, this surprised me tremendously because I was thinking about the significant uh, market positions of Greek banks in Bulgaria. And Bulgaria is part of these Euroized countries, and we don't pick anything up there. Um, and again, the only strongly significant impact of the crisis is reduced bank lending in 2008. We did a, another set of robustness checks. So I've reproduced the coefficients from Model 5 here again, without the bank interactive effects. All of these things that you see on this slide have the same bank, bank interactive effects that you saw before. Model 5 is the benchmark model that we're using. Uh, we first lagged the dependent variable to see if that made any difference. And you can see when you introduce the lag dependent variable, firstly, the coefficient on the lag dependent variable is not statistically significant. Then it really doesn't change much of the results. So the results are still pretty robust to including the lag dependent variable. I mean, if you look down, if you can see the very bottom of the screen, if you look down at the adjusted R squared, it goes up, but that's normal when you include a lag dependent variable, it better go up. Uh, so, you know, that's some of the time trend you were thinking about. Uh, and then we took the full sample without depreciation. We thought maybe this depreciation has because when the domestic currency depreciates, it has that artificial effect on revaluating the bank lending. We wanted to make sure that that wasn't what was driving our results. So we took depreciation entirely out. And when you take depreciation entirely out, you still get the basic results that, that we wanted. In fact, the crisis year dummies become even stronger. So we see the negative impact of the crisis in 2008 and strikingly, a positive impact of the crisis in 2010, okay, for which I have no explanation. But um, what was more important to us is the other foreign variable, which is the blue one up at the top of the column, stayed positive and at least mildly significant. The procyclicality variable is strongly significant. And the cut and run variables the two interactions between foreign crisis 2009 and 2010 stay. So with this robustness check, we're pretty confident that this cut and run effect of other foreign banks is real and that we've picked this up in the data. So here are, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm almost finished. Is that good or not? <laughs> so the takeaways, the big six European multinational banks stayed committed to their home market during the global financial crisis and at the onset, at least, of the Eurozone crisis. Other foreign banks actively sought market share in the good times and then abandoned, I mean, abandoned is too strong a term, but they reduced their exposure in the bad times, to be more precise. And that's what we mean by cut and run, reducing exposure. Bank lending in emerging Europe is sensitive to exchange rate policy. It responds positively to the depreciation of the currency. It's strongly pro-cyclical. The global financial crisis had a different differential impact in 2008 and 2009. Again, that's paired with that ubiquitous depreciation in 2009 in the countries with the flexible exchange rate. So those are conflated, those are commingled in, in the story. And we find preliminary evidence that maybe the Euro, uh, European uh, the, sorry, the Eurozone crisis may have a different impact on bank lending in the region 
than the global financial crisis did. Oh, and these are just, I have full references here for the, the literature. So on the slides, you can find the full references. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, questions? We have about half hour of discussion. Or we can cut and run, I guess. <laughs> I have one question on uh, your sample split. So uh, you have the sample split fixed, non-fixed exchange rate, but it seems that the fixed exchange rate countries are also countries with very small foreign presence. Uh, well, okay. So Can I go I back? Whether it makes sense no, to no, it doesn't apply to Slovakia. Mm, no. No, but so I wonder if you would uh, maybe split. Uh, uh, here we go. Okay, so we've got Slovakia where the big six are really dominant. Yes. We've got Slovenia, I mean, you know, Slovakia and Slovenia are on opposite sides of the spectrum, right? Yes, you have Bulgaria and Slovenia, so I wonder, so, so let me face but, but I only have two years of Slovakia, so that's, ah. that's a, you know, I only have the... Okay, maybe I should ask the audience. I mean, the reason I only kept the, kept the two years was because that's when Slovakia entered the Eurozone. Now, if you look at the exchange rate euro to, I've forgotten what the Slovakian currency was. Krona? I don't know. But anyways, whatever it was. Um, you know, if you look at that domestic exchange rate to the euro in the run-up period to going into the eurozone, it's highly, you know, it's, it's highly stable as you would expect because it has to be. So one of the things I could do in this split is go back and put in all the years for Slovakia. Yeah, but, but so let me put it differently. So, so it seems that most of the uh, observations in the fixed exchange at sample are Bulgaria and Slovenia. Correct. And these are low foreign presence countries. Um, so, alternatively, you would, could do a split where you split uh, low and high on foreign presence and repeat exactly the same questions. But so pick up Poland, in other words. At, at, at Poland, yes. Yeah. So do Slovenia, Poland, Bulgaria, yeah. and yeah. the and see what you find. Because you'd expect uh -huh. in countries where foreign debt is huge, you could have kind of almost a contagious run. Mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. While in countries where it's small, it would be very different. Maybe. So maybe that's yeah. the yeah, yeah. Th then I'd have to get, I'd have to do it without depreciation, though, because obviously I couldn't, I yes. wouldn't want the depreciation yes. variable in there. So I'd have to, I'd have to make the comparison between the model that didn't have depreciation in it. That's that's a good. Remind me to write that down. <laughs> Thank you. And how, how would you suggest I treat Slovakia then? Should I leave it in for the whole period or should I uh, break it's it? It's very tricky because it's, uh, it has a regime shift, right? It's becoming from a f like a non-Eurozone to Eurozone country. Yeah, but... And it's just, it's exactly 2008, I think, they become one. They joined in 2009. In 2009. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you look at the exchange rate in 2008, it's 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 basically yeah. it's on that moving yeah. into the. So even in 2007, I mean, you know, because of the yeah the, the transition into the eurozone, you have to be. But it changes things because uh, so the story told about Hungary, that foreign banks with local household loans but not in the local currency, but in euros or Swiss francs. Swiss francs, yeah. Also in Slovakia. Then Slovakia it won't matter less because they become part of the eurozone and there's a, a complete fixed pack. While in Hungary, no, if it's euros, not Swiss francs, because yeah, yeah, the cross yeah, rate yeah, with Swiss francs matters. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that that was yeah, volatile. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I don't know this. Yeah. Yeah. So but you are the looking at thing. domestic currency, then, don't you? Yeah, but uh, uh, so actually, is, so do you have the data of only lending local currency, or is it the local currency expressed? No, I mean, Bank, Bankscope produces data, as I'm sure you know, in both dollars and euros. Yeah. So we, we first did the whole exercise in dollars. Yeah, yeah. But then we realized that if we're doing the exercise in dollars and we're worried about depreciation, then the dollar-euro cross rate matters too. And so we said, we've got to do something different. We could, I didn't do it in euros. Okay. What I decided to do at that time was convert everything into domestic currency from dollars mm -hmm. and then adjust it for CPI inflation. Mm 
So that's how I got the real, the, the dependent variable in real terms uh, in domestic currency. Okay. But that picture I showed you of, yeah, of that, if you look at that picture in dollars, I think I have it somewhere over there. I mean, the, picture, the numbers are different. They're not quite as extreme, but if you look at that picture, it's, it's the same thing. So, so we're not missing anything because we're doing it in domestic currency in terms of the, you know, the dependent variables time pattern. I know that. I'm not suggesting that, but, so, so, but uh, so, uh, Laura's comment suggested that she thought that the data you have for mm -hmm. the lending denominated in domestic mm -hmm. currency, but actually you have all the lending Revaluated. Yes, so that's correct. Yes, yes, yes. But so you don't know what share of the landings is actually. actually oh, I don't. I don't. I, I don't. I don't know what share of it is FX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do not. No, I mean. And, and that sense, the 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 access to the eurozone could create some problems because yeah. there's things yeah. changing. No, no. Granted, and um, to the best of my knowledge, no one has bank level data denominated that way. So one of the things we thought about doing was trying to dummy out the look at the sort of total FX lending to GDP across the countries. But we have country fixed effects in there too. So granted, country fixed effects aren't picking up precisely what's going on with that FX lending, but presumably we've got some stuff in the country fixed effects that relate to these differences. So that's why I decided not to try to do that in kind of a crude way. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't do bank level data in FX, you know, break out FX. And you can go to the central banks and find out, you know, in aggregate, but that's not going to do it. Uh, but, but I'm sorry, I've come, but before I leave you, so if I do this, I mean, I like this idea, but if I do this, I probably ought to leave Slovakia out of the whole picture because Slovakia is, uh, is highly concentrated. So what you'd like to, like to see <coughs> is if I have Poland, Bulgaria, and Slovenia. Yes, and the rest without Slovakia. Yeah. And, and Hungary is OK in the other. Yeah, yeah. OK, that's, that's interesting. I didn't do that. Yes. So, so can you, have, can you uh, break down into corporate loans and household loans in, the, in uh, your data? Uh, OK, in the data that Bob and Sole use, they have that breakdown. They didn't give me that breakdown because I, I mean, for two reasons. One, because presumably they shouldn't be giving me the data. But secondly, because I wasn't that interested in that breakout. I wasn't, you know, because if I was interested in that, I wouldn't kick out the building societies in Poland. I mean, if I was interested really in, in household type blending, uh, I think it would be more important to, to keep those in. So the, my idea was just that the, the, the corporate lending might be, so, so the reduction in the crisis might be due to demand effects. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. Nobody oh, wants oh. loans. It's not that the, the banks oh. run away. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. For the households, the households that might be less of a demand side. So Why? So, so people would still take mortgages even though, I mean, if they can. Well, there was a hell of a lot of deleveraging in the United States in the households. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not so, I mean, it's not evident to me that that's, that would be the case. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of households in the U.S. during the crisis, uh, they're, they're uh, they, firstly, a lot of them had their homes, mortgages foreclosed. I mean, a lot, some had their home mortgages foreclosed. So, I, I, don't, I mean, my intuition doesn't tell me that it would be necessarily true that, for example, would people take less, uh, car loans out or would they postpone buying a car for a year or two? I, 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 but I grant you that there's a demand side thing in here that we haven't fully captured. One of the things we have in the regressions that Bob and Sole don't are the macro variables, the GDP growth. So I'm suggesting that the GDP growth may pick up some of the demand side. Okay? I mean, it's not, it's not a great way to pick up demand side, but it's a proxy at least. Um, and um, when I talked to them, the problem they had with including the GDP growth in their 
uh, regressions was it, 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 there was an issue in Latin America, not, not in these countries, but because their paper was this comparison between the region and Latin America, there were some things that they found they couldn't do because of the impacts in Latin America. And I don't know, Bob told me something about a referee complaining about something. So. I mean, I'm, I'm old, I'm at the stage where I don't care if the referees complain, they can complain. <laughs> I'm more interested in feedback from you people about what I did wrong. Um, but I'm going to try that. I mean, th th that's a good robustness check. I'm going to try that. Yes? Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, is it worth uh, dropping inflation from the list of uh, your redressers and include some sort of interest rates on loans? Okay. Understand yeah, we, we, how we, the underlying supply or demand uh, effects might influence your main estimation results? Yeah, uh, 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 that's a good comment. At one point we tried to think about how to include an interest rate variable. Uh, the problem is um, the only, the, the way most people, to my understanding, the way most people do that when they use bank scope data is basically construct an implicit interest rate from some of the stuff on the, uh, on the income statement. And um, when Bob and Soleil gave us, the, I don't have access to the full bank scope data. I mean, I'll, I'll admit up front, if, if, if Beaufort wants to give me full access to the bank scope data, then maybe I could do this. But I, I just didn't have access to the data to do it. All I could do was, was use an aggregate in, uh, interest rate, and I didn't think that was appropriate. So we kind of threw our hands up and said, we have to forget about that. Uh, I have data on non-performing loans in a different data set that I'm using. Hmm. The reason I ask is that uh, it's interesting how mm -hmm. across these bank groups, foreign, big six, how non-performing loans hmm. play out. Because, you know, uh, yeah. there are many... Uh, theories uh, what the foreign banks do like they may be cherry picking mm -hmm. to get the best customers and well certainly the greenfields at the beginning were doing that right I mean, I mean one of the reasons that the greenfields came in were the standard argument that you come in behind your corporate client and you provide services to your corporate client so in, in countries like Hungary when uh, GE went in GE finance went in too um, then when the greenfields went in, what I do know when I was working with those data is that you found the, the foreign banks were doing a lot more fee-for-service uh, activity and a lot less lending. But over time, as the foreign banks took over the extant domestic banking sector, they became more involved, especially the big six, became more involved in the whole spectrum of banking activity. So um, I think by this, I mean, th there are two things that are useful about this particular time period. One, by 2004-05, virtually all of the privatization stuff has stopped. So I don't have to, when I did these, these studies back in from 95 to 2005, when I was using those data, and we did have access to bank scope, thanks to Beaufort, when we were using those data, um, one of my co-authors did, uh, we were, uh, it was really hard to keep track of the changes in ownership over time. And at the time, those data too, bank, bank scope didn't give you ownership data. So you had to basically painfully construct, the way you guys painfully constructed your data set uh, on regional banks, we had to painfully construct the ownership variable. I mean, it, it took a long time to do. Um, by the time you get to 2004 or 5 in these countries, there's not a lot of change in ownership. So it's, it, you know, there are a few exceptions which I have in a footnote somewhere in the paper which I've forgotten, but for the most part, there, you know, the ownership variable is, is a stable categoric variable. Um, so at that point, I think any cherry picking that went on had stopped. I mean, the, the, you could argue, I think, quite uh, 
plausibly that Credit Anstalt and maybe even Bank Austria in the 90s were doing a lot of credit, were doing a lot of uh, cherry picking. But once they then merged with their uh, the foreign takeover bank that, that they were involved in, and once Unicredito, once the mother banks all merged, and all of that happened in the late 90s and early 2000s. So that really messes up the data in that beginning part of the period. You have to be very, very careful. But once you get to 2004, I think Kuhn's shaking his head, so I'm, I'm confident what I'm saying is right. Once you get to 2004, then, then the ownership variable is, is, uh, is pretty stable. And, and because of that, I don't think you, I mean, I don't know how I would call out cherry picking. I, mean, I think Rachel Epstein could probably do it for you because she's done all this survey work with, with these, these banks and she knows what, what they do and what they don't do. But I, I don't think cherry picking is, a, is an important part of the story I'm trying to tell. Uh, but, you know, I... I guess I have to ask you to take that on faith. <laughs> but I, you know, I can check, because I do have NPLs, I think, for all of these banks. Why didn't we include NPLs? Hmm. I'm not even remembering whether we did at one point and nothing happened and we just took them out. I, I, I don't know the answer. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask Dana. Dana would know. Dana did all the, the data work for me. So I'll ask her if we ever put NPLs in. But let me think about that. Um, so why? So why would NPLs influence the sort of stuff I'm interested in? That is the cut and run strategies, big six staying committed. I and mean, that's the main message of my story. I, I, I think the, the banker will tell us. No, 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 no. I think one of the possibilities should be to find that the other four banks grow faster before the crisis. Yes. So maybe they grow faster by taking more risk. Yes. They are hit heavier by the crisis, and that's why they cut them off. That's the story, although they're trying to talk. Yeah, so no, I, I think that's a reasonable interpretation of, of, of the empirics, yeah. And one way of testing it is that you see the non-performing loans go up more for the other foreign debt. And then you have that kind of mechanism mm. to explain that. Mm. That's what you no, I mean, I grant that, that I believe that the other foreign banks were taking on more risk. I mean, surely that's the standard story when, when you see them growing faster, right? And, um... You got the lemons. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Well, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's the old Stiglitz Weiss story. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but, uh... It's yeah, it's but, 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 but it's complicated. It, it, it's actually conflated in the region by FX lending. And that's, you know, again, that's, I guess, I'd love to have those data, but no, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has them. I mean, I'm sure regulators have them, but they won't give them to me. Yeah, thanks. It's a good example of uh, saints and sinners, in a sense. So the current bank seems to be a saints and the good times and sinners and that. <laughs> but uh, do you think that these big six banks that are based on your story were able to maintain the credit growth or whatever the loan grows in the domestic country. Do you think it happened because they were so big and because they got some sort of bailout in the parent uh, but of the parent institution in the home country? So okay, there, there's the man that knows about one of the bailouts in of one of the banks, but I mean, I was told, I guess, incorrectly that there were restrictions on, on their activity then in the region. So that is true. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. KBC had to sell, uh, for example, Absolute Bank in Russia. Yeah. And there were other restrictions because they got the bailout. So yeah. That, yeah it but it works the other way, right? I mean, a bailout was well, it, forced them to kind of. Re uh, well, well, well it, it, it could work because you look until 2010. So initially, the big guys got the bailout. That's why they didn't keep this money. But then the European Commission forced them in the longer run. I see. Divest, and the divestment started in 2011-2012. I see. So I have to extend the data set to yeah. pick that up. So they yeah, yeah, yeah. Standing, but they sold off some uh -huh. of the because they were forced yeah. to downsize by the European Commission as a response to the bill. And the divestment might happen in countries that, like Russia, no? that you don't yeah. have any samples. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure, sure. That's sure. why they go so to Armenia. That's why they go to Armenia. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, no. And an important part of, the, of, of at least the message I'm trying to get out there is, look, this is a group of countries 
that have a special characteristic. That is, this is the second home market for these banks. And because it's the second home market for these banks, they treat these countries differently from the way they would treat Kazakhstan or, you know, whatever. So it's, I mean, initially I know from being on the ground that initially when the, at least the American banks came in, their business model was to come into the region with eyes on, on Russia, for sure, uh, and, and to establish their, you know, credibility in the region. So some of, the, some of their activities in the region uh, were with a long-term, more of a long-term profit motive. That is, we want to we want to go into the larger countries where we think that's really where the action is. So we'll hang around in Hungary. But I think you know by the time we look at at this period, that all of that's finished. But so for Dennis' question, this maybe even data because it's the direct the director general of competition in Europe that decided how the should downsize. And there were agreements made with all these banks, plans available on the websites where they were supposed to sell. So uh -huh. banks had to propose a plan. The commission agreed and does not agree. And so uh, KBC proposed to sell part of Poland and Russia. So there is some data on, uh -huh. on, on this, I think. But oh, that's interesting. And so if you have ever extend the data uh, for Liberia, I think you need to get these restructuring plans. Yeah. Because uh, it's kind of exogenous almost. OK. And this, this applies to all of the big six banks or just KBs? OK. Unicredit was involved in that as well? Yes, Unicredit, I think, Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer? I should check. Yeah. OK. Well, we can, yeah. Sure, uh, Sounds like another paper. You want to write it with me? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know enough of the details to, to, to say anything that I'm comfortable saying right now. So, so if are the six, I'm still thinking why these big six, they behave so differently. Maybe they're, so... Well, they behave differently not from all banks. They behave like domestic banks. Yep. Yes. That's and, the point. And, and so looking at the list, uh, so three of the six are Austrian banks, if you count Unicredit, as yes. I said. Yes, yes, correct. Austrian bank. Yes. So maybe there are some historical patterns basically uh, mm -hmm. like recreating the Austrian-Hungarian empire, like in this country-to-country -country, uh, relationship. So maybe sure. you could pick up uh, some of those, basically having a different classification of... Um, you want big banks, three? Uh, ...being active in country that kind of had historical ties. Yeah. So do you want big three, basically? Well, you, could, you can have you want some... Esther, Refizen, and yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so what do I think? Exclude the rest, rest of the six. Well, I mean, KBC doesn't of have a... Foreign banks also, yeah. I mean, of the smaller ones that... Uh, that, that no, 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 because what happened with the other... What happened basically there were merges in the home... I mean, you know, in, in Austria, the merges of Credit Anstalt initially in Bank Austria, and then that becoming part of Unicredit. So I don't think we have any Austrian banks... I mean, there are small ones, of course, but any Austrian banks in there that of any significance that are... Uh, different from what I have in the big six. Mm -hmm. Breaking the big six on the Austrian component, including the Unicredit in Austria, would pick up a substantial... Let me go back to that slide. Uh, I'm going to say it would reduce some of these numbers in there, certainly by no more than 30%, maybe even less, because Unicredit, Refizen, and Ersta are the three main players in the region of the big six. KBC has a very small, one minute, KBC has a, that's for you guys, not for me, you're asking the questions, has a, a and it's in your self-interest to police me because it lunches on the table. I thought at first when I knew Ika wasn't coming that I was gonna have to monitor myself and I thought, wow, that's wonderful. I like being in situations where I monitor myself. Who monitors the monitor? Uh, but, uh, so, so I think, I, I mean, I hadn't thought about that. I, you know, I mean, it's, perf it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do in terms of a robustness check, I think. But, I, but for me, it, I, I would do it on just that dimension, take those three out and make a big three. Yeah, and perhaps, um, I, I'm not so sure, I mean, my history is not too good. So the, among the, the host countries, Poland definitely would not go, go in. So, I mean, you know, 
Oh, well, amongst the host countries, the big thing in Poland, I mean, because German banks are in here too. German banks are part of the other foreign banks, okay? Uh, and Poland was adamant about keeping German banks out at the beginning. I mean, I remember sitting <laughs> over probably too much wine with, with Polish bankers telling me that the Germans will take over our banking system. And I said, you've got to be kidding. Your banking system isn't worth taking over. I mean, you know, you, you, bank has to be, as I said once in Bulgaria, the bank has to be endowed before anybody wants to take it over. And the translation in Bulgaria, I'll leave to your imagination because it was not what I really meant. <laughs> Um, okay. Anything else? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your interest and for your comments. Um, I think my email is on there. Uh, so I'd be very happy of anything. No, it isn't. But it's just jmonin at wesleyan.edu. So uh, please send me an email if you have any thoughts or suggestions, and I'd be very happy to include them and think about them. And thanks so much for your attention. I appreciate it.